but this is not you know, usually applicable to lucid dreaming because we don't have fevers. But I will say one thing about body temperature and dreaming and lucid dreaming. Uh, REM sleep itself is temperature dependent. If you are too cool, you do not go into REM sleep because our body temperature regulation stops working in REM sleep. So I wouldn't be surprised that when you have this fever at the higher temperature ranges, that might have strongly stimulated your REM function. And that may be why you had the experiences at that particular time. So, but again, it's another one of those mysterious things in the, the night. So. People often ask me to explain specific strange events in their lives. The problem is I usually don't have enough information about the event. Yeah, this is an excellent example of that sort of thing, which I don't know. Yeah, and you know, there are, of course, some things I can explain and some things I can't. So I hope you will ask me more about the things I can. Well, I would suspect that uh, some of these differences have to do with people's experience and expectation, what they have read. So, so for example, in my own experience, out of thousands of lucid dreams, most all of them, I am fully embodied. Here I am in a, uh, a small minority of my non-lucid dreams. I may be sort of watching events happening over there. But I never become lucid unless I'm involved. And so it seems to require a balance of, of, of interaction and detachment. I call the two perspectives that we're talking about the actor perspective, where I feel I am in a world doing something. And that's both the perspective we have right now and the usual one we have in dreams. But what happens in a lucid dream typically is at the same time I think I am involved in this world, but this whole world is in my mind. And so that observer perspective is outside or meta to the entire world that the actor is in. And that's what gives the, that sort of informs the actor of the new possibilities. And the, the, t the tendency when one loses lucidity is to get too involved with the body. So, for example, I might be at the top of a tall building in a dream, and uh, I feel the fear of the heights. And this tells me that I'm dreaming because the fear is stronger than usual. The strange thing is, it, even though I say, ah, this is a dream, it will be very difficult for me to simply step off the building because I have such strong conditioning not to do things like that. So what I have to do to overcome that is to step in the air straight up while I'm still on the surface of the building. Once I'm suspended in the air, then I can go over the edge. So I sort of find a way to go around the usual expectation, which is not to jump off the building, but there's nothing that tells me not to go up. We don't have to have any prohibitions preventing us from floating to the ceiling <laughs> in our minds. We have an expectation, but we don't have a motivation saying we fear to do it. Whereas we have a real and important fear that prevents us from jumping out of windows and things like that. So this is illustrating what I said before of... Part of learning to have lucid dreams and to make use of the dream world is to learn to change your model of the world in a, an appropriate fashion. And so what, what you should do when you wake up from each lucid dream is you should ask yourself, was there anything that you did or thought in that dream that didn't make sense? And then you can remember in future lucid dreams not to think in that way. So, so, for example, once I realized that it didn't make sense to expect to find my sleeping body in the same world I was dreaming, I stopped thinking that, except for in the few instances where I deliberately decided, well, let's do an experiment to visit my bedroom and sleeping body and it, it get some information that I put in an envelope next to the bed and things like that. But it's, it is absolutely essential that you have to be critical of your dream state of mind after you wake up. Otherwise, you, you don't progress. So make sure that you're not engaging in uh, logical absurdities. 
And, and the only rule I think we can trust in terms of dreaming and other experiences is consistency. So, so I'm flying in one world. Do I think my, bot, my physical body is in this world? If so, this is the physical world I'm flying in. If it's not the physical world, then why would my body be in it? It's very simple as saying, I'm going to hold on to one principle, and that is the principle of contradiction. And so I'll just make sure that the way I understand the world doesn't contradict what else I already believe I know. So we have time for one more question. Yes, yes, yes. I, I think you can use in the lucid dream any techniques you know from any other state of consciousness. Because if you've had experience in some other state of consciousness that you have an understanding of how things could change or work with that, it will work in your dream in the same way. Ah. Um, in a sense, partly. The main difference is for me, for example, If I shut my eyes and relax deeply and imagine that I am at the beach, it's sort of as if I'm there, but it doesn't feel as if I really am there. Whereas in the lucid dream, it's just like this. It's as real as being there. Well, for some people who have very vivid imagery, uh, lucid dreaming and the vivid imagery of a trance state will be quite similar. For the average person, though, who has uh, imagery that is not very vivid, There's a big difference, but some not. So, uh, and again, uh, any two states of consciousness have something in common. And some are much more close than others, and trance kinds of states are something like dreaming, because you are isolated from the external world at the same time as your mind is active. Okay. So we're now going, we are going to talk about back to where. I would like to explain to you the sense in which the Tibetan Buddhists have said for more than a thousand years that this is a dream. To explain that fully, we have to be a little indirect and go back to understand how it is we came to have the brains we have. I consider it you know, highly likely that the brains that we have are the product of biological evolution. And we'll be assuming that in the demonstration I give. So let us imagine a, a very simple organism uh, many millions of years ago. This would be a creature that could only determine what was good or bad by bumping into it. So if it were something good or something to eat, it could then engulf it, approach. Something bad for the organism, a poison, a predator, it could have frog. Um, I'm sure you can see how difficult a way of getting around in life that would be. So one day a little creature happened to invent a little feeler that could determine what was over there and whether I should approach or avoid. And now if what was over there was poison or a predator, it might lose their little hair and it could grow another one, but it didn't have to cook, didn't have to put its entire body into the question. And, and once it and this is something that has obvious survival value. And the way biological evolution proceeds is that creatures that develop by random or other means a new feature that makes them more <coughs> suited to pass on genes to their descendants, to pass on descendants are likely then to pass on that characteristic to their descendants. So next we have a creature that builds another one of these nerve-like cells that is connected to the first one and becomes a network so that the organism cannot just sense what's there now but can predict what will be there next. Again, that has obvious survival value. 